Good evening, everyone. Uh, my talk is about Tunney, uh, which you've already heard is a short little Zufax uh, machine. <clears throat> and uh, it, its solution led to the development of Colossus, which by some people's definition is the first large scale electronic programmable computer. My name is Ted Coles. I'm a volunteer guide at the National Museum of Computing. The outline of my talk is that I shall talk about um, how Tunney appeared, um, the way that a way of setting, finding the start position of the wheels for a particular transmission was worked out or some of that, um, the machines that were developed to automate a crucial part of this process, which led by the end of the war, and it was only for a relatively short period from February 1944 to the end of the war in Europe in um, May 1945. But during that time, some 63 million characters of German military telegrams uh, that discussed very high level information were, um, <clears throat> were deciphered. Now, uh, I'd be happy to answer questions after uh, my presentation. Uh, please use the chat feature to pose any questions you may have. So during the Second World War, of course, both sides uh, listened in as much as they could to the other's transmission. And uh, Enigma messages, uh, the Enigma is more widely known than, than this machine. Enigma messages were, were relatively short and were transmitted using Morse code. But in June 1941, the uh, radio telegraphy was, well, there had been some experimental um, transmissions before that, but radio te telegraphy messages began to be heard on at the intercept stations on a regular basis. Now, telegraphy is a system for sending information electronically over long distances, been going since Victorian times, and it's essentially a two-state system. And radio telegraphy is transmitted of two tones. Now, uh, these messages are much faster and longer than, uh, uh, than the messages uh, transmitted using Morse. So they were recorded um, on pen undulators at the intercept stations where the signal strength, of course, wasn't all that good. And then young girls in the um, ATS, auxiliary territorial service, were taught to interpret these patterns and then punch standard telegraph five-hole paper tape. So a bunch of these things, whoops, a bunch of these uh, things gives a particular character, and then a character is punched to paper tape. So one line across the tape represents one character. So at the National Museum of Computing in the Sunny Gallery, you can see receiving equipment and these undulators, and there's the paper tape that comes out of them. They weren't actually located at uh, Lexley Park because they needed big aerials uh, to get an adequate signal, and uh, big aerials might have attracted German bombs. So why Tunney? Well, basically, it was just because uh, Bletchley Park and the people and the government code and site of school, as it was officially known, um, wanted to give pet names to all sorts of things. And radio transmission links were given the name of fish. So Tunny and Fish were subsequently used for all of the radio tele telegraphy messages. And this is what the network looked like. Um, the period between March 1943 and July 1944. 
And you can see Berlin is the center of a set of stations, uh, the hub for the Western Front and Königsberg for the Eastern Front. But there are things connections, of course. Now, the, there was far more information uh, than could be uh, than resources to decipher it, even with the automation. But Jellyfish, which was the Berlin-Paris link, and Bream, which was the Berlin-Rome link, were two that were particularly valuable to the Allies. Now, the structure of the tonnage transmissions was that they used the standard international alphabet for a preamble, which included a 12-letter sequence. Now, this is the international uh, telegraph alphabet, and you can see it has uh, to be able to provide more than just the basic 32 characters, there is a, a sense that you have a letter shift and uh, then those are the characters and figure shift and then those are the characters. So letters and figure shift are the uh, characters that change from one state to another. But of course, once all the characters are enciphered, the uh, letter and figure shift characters lose their meaning. So at Bletchley Park, these, this is how the characters were uh, named. So A to Z as in standard letter shift, then carriage return and line feed, which are formatting characters three and four, uh, letter shift eight, figure shift five, space nine, and the null character with no punching in the tape is uh, indicated with the oblique stroke. So sort of the 12 letter sequence was an indicator from the transmitting end to the receiving end how to set the wheels on a 12 wheel rotor cipher machine. Now, if you're trying to send a secret message with radio telegraphy using a stream cipher, whereby the stream of characters are typed up on the teleprinter and combined with a stream of characters generated within the machine. And I've put here the uh, abbreviations I'm going to use P for the plain text as typed up and Z for the cipher text. So the teleprinter or teleprinter typewriter is connected electrically to the ciphering machine, connected to electrically to the radio transmitter. At the receiving end, you have the radio receiver connected electrically to the deciphering machine and uh, then onto a teleprinter. Now, that means that you only have, need to have one operator at each end and the operators don't see the cipher tape. At all. Now it's not likely that this would use a uh, what's known as a Vernan cipher, which uses the exclusive OR. Um, it, it's also binary addition and subtraction. So the way that works is that if the two inputs are the same, the output is a dot. I should say dot and and, and cross are the two states. Um, cross indicating mark and dot indicating space in standard telegraphy terminology. So inputs the same, you get a dot, inputs different, you get a cross. Now the great advantage of the XOR cipher is that the same process is used for both the enciphering and deciphering. So in the previous slide, I talked about the enciphering machine and the deciphering machine. They are the same machine set up the same way, which is obviously extremely uh, convenient. So this is how it works in, in practice. Uh, plain text A typed on the teleprinter, and in this occasion, the internal key stream uh, character is C, and that produces F. Differ, cross, same. Dot, differ, differ, cross, cross, same, same, dot. At the deciphering end, 
you have the ciphertext letter F, that pattern, the same operation, the exclusive or, or binary addition, and you've got differ X, differ X, same, 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 dot, 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 back to the plain text letter that you had before, A. Now, this is the uh, com combination table, and I want to highlight a few, or well, this is like one corner of the combination table, and I want to highlight a few, sorry about that, highlight a few characteristics of it. First of all, any letter combined with itself gives the null character. Secondly, any letter combined with the null character gives itself. And thirdly, that I gave an example uh, a few slides back of a, uh, a set of characters F, C, and A, and that they form what you can call a triple. Um, and in that F and C combined together give A, F and A combined together give C, and A and C combined together give F. So in fact, the, although the, the total table is uh, 1,024, um, there were actually only 155 of these uh, uh, triples that had to be memorized. Now, operators being human, don't always obey their instructions exactly. And one of the very useful things they do, very useful to crypt analysts, is to give what are known as depth. Uh, depth is when two or more messages have the same key. Now, the weakness of the uh, Vernamal exclusive or cipher is that if two messages have the same enciphering sequence, i.e. that same key stream, XORing together the two ciphertexts, each of which contains the key stream, produces the same result as having XOR together the two plain texts, because the two uh, key streams cancel each other out. So if you have a situation where the second message is a retransmission, rather than a complete different uh, subject matter altogether, the two plain texts, and you can then, and, and you're able to discover the two plain texts, XORing the ciphertext with the plain text produces the key stream. And this is just what happened. Um, this all started up, like I said, June 41, 30th of August 1941, two successive unusually long messages, 4,000 characters or just under, um, were intercepted with this 12 letter string as their indicator. Presumably it was a retransmission, but the operators hadn't chosen 12 fresh letters. And furthermore, had the, the two versions of the message been typed identically, every single character exactly the same and in exactly the same place. XORing together uh, would have produced a string of null characters, but they didn't. For the first time round, the uh, operator typed the word Sprook number in full, had some German for message number, and that second time round, he abbreviated number to NR which is a standard German abbreviation. And from that, uh, they were able to uh, exclude altogether the two ciphertexts and Colonel John Tiltman, um, uh, BB's senior cryptanalyst, managed to prize apart those two plain texts and identified which ciphertext was which. And from that, they were then able to obtain just short of 4,000 characters of key stream. 
this is when we encounter Bill Tutt. Bill Tutt was a young man who had um, graduated from Cambridge with, in chemistry, strangely, although basically it was a mathematician at heart, switched to maths in his postgraduate period. And he had had some uh, training and had been working on some other uh, ciphers from rudimentary cipher machines. And then he was um, sent to the research section. By which time the research section had had a go at trying to work out how this unseen machine worked. Um, and they said, we pursued this idea, found it to be incorrect. Uh, you have a go. And that's what he did. And he then worked out how the unseen machine worked, which was an incredible thing. And the way he did it, I don't understand all of what he did, but if you're looking at something where there is a periodicity, then you can use a technique which uh, is known as the Kaczynski technique. And it involves writing out the key, uh, dividing a key up into chunks of length i, and um, writing out those chunks uh, in rows of a table and looking for repetitions in the columns. Um, however, what length do you choose for i? Uh, and, and that is always a problem with this technique. It, it was, when it was first used, it was used for relatively short key sequences, um, uh, fewer than a dozen, and that wasn't uh, much of a problem. But in this case, um, Bill Tuck was faced with a, a problem of how to choose a sensible value for i. And so this is how you work the Kaczynski technique. So here I've got a a section from um, a chart like this where the length chosen is 23, so the length of i is 23. And also, it's not the full um, character by character um, key stream, it's just bit one of the key stream, hence dots and crosses. So, it had been observed that there were 25 different letters used for the first 11 letters of the indicator, but only 23 for the 12. So Bill Tutt starts off by trying uh, 25 times 23, which is 575. He didn't see repetitions in the columns as he was hoping, but there was suspicion of something on the diagonal. So he tried 574 and did see some repetitions. But it was unlikely a machine would have uh, a, a, a wheel with 524 different positions on it. But being mathematician, you immediately thought, well, prime factors of 524, 2, 7, and 41. 41 is the sort of size that a wheel might be in a machine of this sort. So he tried 41. And as he put it, the columns were replete with repetitions. That's when he spoke about it in the 1980s. And here is the, uh, the table he was working on and looking for repetitions. And it's a very painstaking business. So I'll show you where the repetitions are. So there are three repetitions here, red, green, and blue. And that was enough for him to say, Part of the enciphering process is happening with a wheel with 41 positions on it. And it is repeating after 41. But something else was going on because it didn't happen all the time. Um, and what he eventually worked out was that there were, for bit one, it was going through a letter which he called Chi one, big mathematician, he, he liked to use Greek letters. And then through a second wheel, which he called 
the psi wheel. And this wheel, as you would expect, advanced one position for each new character coming in. But this wheel, the psi wheel, didn't. It only advanced intermittently about half the time under the control of these two new on motor wheels. And that's how the inciphering, inciphering process worked. So the key stream, uh, what he, once he'd worked that out for the bit one, uh, his colleagues in the research section use his method to work out the others. And so what they concluded was that the, there was a chi component and a psi component of the inciphering process. The five chi wheels all moved together, one position for each new character coming in. And the five psi wheels also all moved together, but intermittently under the control of the two new or motor wheels. And these numbers here are the number of positions on the different wheels. And those of you so inclined will spot that they are all bar two prime numbers and that the two non-primes are themselves products of primes so that the whole set is co-prime, which maximizes the uh, repetition time. So eventually, Tunney was revealed, but that was not until Kesslering surrendered in May 45. And that was when the Allied allies knew that what they were dealing with, or what they had been dealing with, was this Trussell Zusat, which means teleprinter attachment, um, SZ42. So there's Cut's diagram. This is what the machine looks like with its cover on. There it is with its cover off, but with the cover over the, the wheels, the 12 wheels, closed. And you can see beside each wheel, there is a little window which shows a number. And the mapping between the letters of the indicator and the number positions of the wheels was changed weekly. If you lift that cover, you can see the wheels like this. And you can see that each wheel has on it a number of cams, and these cams can either be in the raised position, the active position, or in the lowered position, inactive position. If they're in the raised position, they reverse the sense of a bit that they're processing. If they're in the uh, lowered position, but if they, they leave it alone. So there was a group that, of linguists uh, linguist cryptanalysts who were having a little bit of success when the operators sent through um, the sort of uh, depth that uh, I spoke about earlier. And they wanted a machine which would imitate the machine, emulate, if you like, this unseen tummy machine. And here is a wartime photograph which shows a couple of these machines. And here is what you can see in the Tunney Gallery at the National Museum of Computing. So that, as well as making an incredible achievement of working out how the machine worked, he also achieved another great achievement, which was what, what became known as the one plus two breaking. Now, the number of cams on the wheels, as I said, is co-prime. So the repetition time and the number of ways of setting 12 wheels is an astronomically large number, 16 million, million, million. Even if you consider just the chi wheels, that's 22 million, which is too many for an exhaustive search. But Bill Tan, devised a method of scurrying the start position of just the Chi-1 and Chi-2 wheels, which is a mere 41 times 31, 1,271 different start positions, which could be tried. 
So this is a number you can de deal with with an exhaustive search, if you can automate it. And just an aside, a, a very important aside, before I continue with the, uh, that story, I should point out that an important discovery, and I think it was made by Alan Turing, but I'm not sure about that, was that there was a pattern to the occurrence of adjacent characters in the plain text, and that by performing on the plain text, or indeed on the future to plain text, which we'll come to in a moment, the, the so-called DKI, you can get out this characteristic pattern. So the way it works is that if you have four successive characters of the plain text, one and two combines to give the delta, the first delta character, two and three, the second delta character, three and four, the third delta character. And Bill Tutt exploited that fact that the frequency distributions of the delta characters in the plain text form these characteristic patterns. So here's an example of, of how deltering works. A uh, exclusive or x gives v, x exclusive or null gives x, null exclusive or p, p, p exclusive or h gives 4, h exclusive or h gives null, h exclusive or q gives a. So, now, the relationship, just putting it to symbolically, the relationship between the plain text and the ciphertext, plain text P, ciphertext Z, is given by this equation. P, plain text, exclusive or the chi component of the enciphering stream, exclusive or the psi component of the exclusive or, uh, of the enciphering process. And that gives the ciphertext there. And you can write it the other way around, that if you have got Z, the ciphertext, which is after all what you've received over from the intercept station, and you can get the right value of the chi and of the psi, that gives you the plain text. But if you apply this deltering process to all the components of that uh, equation, delta z, exclusive or delta chi, exclusive or delta psi, gives you delta plain text. Now, given that the chi, uh, the psi wheels only move intermittently about half the time, sometimes when the psi wheels don't move, Delta psi is null. So you can ignore it. And then you have delta ciphertext exclusive or delta chi, and that is delta p. So with the correct delta chi removed from delta z, delta p is revealed. So how this was actually that uh, worked in practice for the one plus two break in was that this equation, this Boolean expression was evaluated. And when it was true, that was uh, counted. And if the starting position being tested for the chi wheels, the two chi wheels, is wrong, this number will be approximately 50% of n, where n is the number of characters in the message. If it's right, it's approximately 55% of n. So given that there's an error distribution around both of those, it's not a big difference. But it worked the majority of the time. And then once you got chi 1 and chi 2, you could try, these were some of the more popular things that were tried, the more productive ones. Uh, four and five, two and five, one and five, three and four, one and three, and so on, until you've gradually worked out and got the start position of all five of the chi wheels. 
and then you can derive a putative um, plain text or a partial plain text because some of the characters will be uh, the plain text characters, some of them will not. So when the sky wheel don't move, then uh, the delta uh, thing will give you uh, d chi. This is referred to the d chi. So if you remove the um, chi component, so you've got delta plane text, uh, delta cipher text, excuse me, delta uh, chi, then that gives you what was called the d chi. And once a Newman ring, that's where the automation uh, took place, were happy with the delta d chi, it was passed to the Ralph Tester test section where the uh, uh, linguists were in the testery. And they um, then were able to work out the psi and uh, new wheel setting. Um, and they did that with linguistic and cribbing methods and so on. We don't know so much about that. The frequency distribution of different characters of delta d chi was an important in verifying that the chi settings were correct. So here's an example of the delta d chi. Um, this is the jellyfish link, Berlin end, because the characteristic, these characteristic frequency distributions of the delta d chi characters was a, um, a thing which varied from and the different ends of the different links in the network. So the obvious one to think about actually is the null character, where you have had two adjacent characters the same in the uh, original plain text. But it's done, that's not actually the most popular one. The most popular one is with, where you have a space character and a letter shift character adjacent. So that's going to happen at the beginning of a new sentence. Now, the automation was uh, Max Newman and Cambridge Math Don was uh, tasked with setting up an automation section. And he that was in December 42. And he produced a, um, a specification of, of what he wanted. And the first implementation of that was the Heath Robinson so-called by the apparently by the Lorraine operators because it reminded people of the weird and wonderful cartoon machines that were produced by a cartoonist called Heath Robinson. And this is what you can see at the uh, National Museum of Computing. It's a reconstruction of a early Heath Robinson machine. So here you have what was called the bedstead, strange name, but that's what it's called. Um, and here you have a counter, which gives the count that I, I uh, made reference to earlier. Now, this is 1943, and there was no practical memory uh, method of storing things in memory. Uh, 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 in, at that time. So although electronics had been developed for uh, radio and um, radar, and were used for amplifying binary signals for uh, telegraphy, they, uh, there was no memory. So what they did very ingeniously was to type up ciphertext on to standard paper tape, glue the two ends together with uh, Bostic, so they could then go around these wheels and be read and reread and reread. So it's cycling round, and that, in a sense, is the, the memory of the ciphertext. 
And then on the Heath Robinson machine, there is a second tape here, uh, which follows a similar path. And that has got the chi wheel information that you're interested in at the moment. And the two, uh, two tapes are intentionally out of step so that each one of the possible start positions of the chi wheel sequence can be uh, tested. And the output comes alternately on counter A and counter B. So the uh, the counters were produced. The counter was produced by uh, C.E. Wim Williams, and uh, the rest of it was made by the post office research establishment people um, at Dolly Hill. And the ciphertext and the chi tape shift in length, so they could start. Um, Try all the possible start positions. Now, Heath Robinson was a success. It showed that Tapp's method of finding the initial wheel settings was effective. Um, and the two tapes were read. They had to be kept in very strict syn synchrony. The two tapes were read at 2,000 characters a second. They were read photoelectrically. But they sometimes lost synchrony and they broke. So with a 6,000 character take, a new count appeared alternately on counters A and B every three seconds for the REN operators to read. So that was not a very, that was a, a slight, well, it was a serious <laughs> error prone process, frankly. And Tommy Flowers said, I, I, I'm not really happy with it. Tommy Flowers was the head of the switching section of the post office research management. And he had been responsible for um, much of the machine, not counting, but the rest. And he said he had been, thought you could do better generating the chi sequence electronically instead of just having one tape chi. And about some, despite some skepticism about them, the reliability of a machine containing some uh, 1500 valves, vacuum tubes, work started on Colossus in February 1943. It first worked uh, at Dollis Hill where uh, flowers worked in December 43, dismantled, re-erected Block F Flexi Park in January 44, and solved its first real problem on the 5th of February 1944. So this is why I said from February 44 through to May 45 was this relatively limited period during which Garthus did all this fantastic work. Those who've been skeptical of it uh, were uh, quite quickly won round. It was reading its tape at 5,000 characters per second. If you gave it the same problem twice, you always got the same answer, which is a desirable characteristic. And in uh, March, they placed an order for four, please, of the new improved version, because by the time you built a prototype, you worked out a better way of doing it, albeit with two and a half thousand valves. Um, and then in April, that order was increased to 12. And the first of these Mark II machines, uh, the much bigger machine, was brought into use on the 1st of June, 1944 just in time for the D-Day. And it provided useful information. Um, Class I, one and four were housed in block F, uh, five to 10 in block H, which was built in the summer of 44. And we claim it as the world's first purpose-built computer suite. So that is the famous wartime photograph of two REN operators operating Colossus. And there is a wartime photograph of Colossus 10 in what is now the Tunney Gallery at the National Museum of Computing. So, hallowed ground. End of the war, all bar two Colossi were dismantled into such small units that their use couldn't be inferred. Max Newman took a lorry load of Colossus parts to Manchester, where, well, that's another story. 
always kept secret until the mid 19th century when the government eventually admitted that electronic equipment had been used at Lake Park during the war, but not much more about it than that. And they released eight photographs that importantly allowed those that had built Colossus to talk about it. And Tony Sale, who was the first director of the uh, Museum of Lecture Park and had a lot to do with it being saved from the developer's uh, wrecking ball, thought the best way of finding out about this, uh, this machine that had been built during the war was to build one. And this is what you can see in the Colossus Gallery at the National Museum of Computing. And that's the front view of it. So you've got Bedstead on the right hand side, similar to that on his Robinson machine, and the output on the left. So here's the bedstead, here's a photoelectric tape reader. This tape goes at nearly 30 miles an hour to achieve 5,000 characters a second. Here you've got a selection panel and a quick Q switch panel. Here's a, this is the selection panel. This is the wall time photograph. This is uh, the machine built by Tennis Sale and his team. And you can see here that the, what is going through to the, uh, the Q panel is, in this case, delta Z. In that case, delta Z as well. And delta chi. In this case, delta psi is going through as well. But uh, in fact, when I took this photograph, the um, there wasn't a psi uh, wheel being counted. Here you have the uh, a switch for near and far. That's only referring to which of the two tapes. Only one is analyzed at the time, and the other position can be used for unloading and reloading. Here is a Q panel where the Boolean expression that is to be counted and, and which counter it goes into and so on are all set up. So this, in a sense, is the program. Remember, no memory. But you'll see things are in groups of five. And the reason for that is that although this is not a general purpose computer and it's not a stored program computer, it does have a modern feature of five processors working in parallel. So you can set up five different programs going into five different counters. Oops. So he, this is where the information comes out on these five counters. And the tape that we normally run has about 6,000 characters in the message, being read at 5,000 characters a second. So every 1.2 seconds, the whole system moves on. The character generated by the um, simulation of the chi wheels um, changes. And it does that with a clicking sound because that part of it is electromechanical rather than electronic. But of course, that means you're getting these things coming out every 1.2 seconds, five counts every 1.2 seconds, which is more than you can, uh, you can uh, pick up by eye. But if you printed everything out on these, the sort of printer that was available in those days, this isn't quite uh, the type of printer that was built into classes. Uh, if you printed it out, you slow everything down and the whole thing would become impossible. So what they did is to compute statistically a threshold value. Remember I said that uh, a wrong uh, setting of the chi wheel, the chi wheels that you're looking at, so you look at two chi wheels at a time usually, uh, a wrong setting of those will give a count of approximately 50% of the number of characters in the message. The right setting, uh, the right start position, will give a count of approximately 55%. So between those two, there is a, a, a practical threshold that the statisticians computed, which was then 
uh, for the set total set up on the um, switches here and the rotary switches for the five different counters. So if any one of the five counters exceeded its set total, it was printed out. It was buffered and then printed out, actually. Um, so the printer didn't hold things up too much. But if, if the printer was busy, uh, when a new set of information was available, then the adva advancing stopped uh, until it, the printer was available. Now, what I've been talking about is working out what the wheel, the wheel position was for the current message. Each message had its own 12 wheel settings, uh, indicated with the 12 wheel indicator, which incidentally is not a very secure system and the Germans changed it quite quickly, but by then the damage was done. So that's what wheel setting is about. But it is dependent on another process called wheel braking. And that is working out which of these cams is in the raised position and which is in the lowered position. Now, fortunately, uh, at the start of the system, uh, the Germans didn't change the cam settings very frequently. They did for the new wheels, but for the Kai wheels, it's once a month, and for the Bazaar wheels, it's once a quarter. So that was very fortunate. But the wheel braking was something that had to be done first, but at least you had information from multiple messages. Now, I'm come, I don't have time to talk about the wheel braking process, and we don't actually have as much information about this as we would like. The, there were a total of 501 cams on the 12 wheels, and so the possible number of ways of, the, of setting those 501 <coughs> cams, albeit only uh, about half on each wheel was set, and half unset, is still an astronomically large number. So this was, Knockhold was the name of the principal. Uh, intercept station that was uh, intercepting the uh, tunnery, tunny transmissions. And then we had the testery who did the initial uh, wheel braking. Usually, later it, it was automated, in the area, but most of the time it was the testery that did the wheel braking. And the numerary, which was the uh, automation bit with uh, Glottis. So they had to choose, that uh, a choice had to be made as to which messages were accepted. And there was an input from the section uh, known as six, uh, which did traffic analysis, signals intelligence and traffic analysis, um, saying what things are, are, are useful. There was also some feedback from Hub 3. Hub 3 was the absolute hub of the military intelligence generating process at Lexley Park. So they would free feedback and say, you know, these are things that they interested in. And they were the people who took input from a number of sources, not just Enigma and, and, um, uh, and Tunney, but many other sources, and fed out to the White, Whitehall ministries, War Office, MI6, etc., and also sent out signals to the field. So, Supreme House Headquarters, other expeditionary force, and various army groups. Now, the uh, the US involvement in this was quite substantial in one way or another. And uh, a crypt analyst from the US Signal Corps, which became the NSA in America, uh, called Albert Small, was uh, drafted to Glacier Park and worked in the uh, test area in Newman Ray. And in December 1944, he wrote back to his headquarters at uh, Arlington Hall in the following words, and I'll leave you to read these.
So that is a an independent or relatively independent assessment. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. I don't know, Jerry, if, if we've had uh, any questions come up in the chat. As yet, we have not, but we are now ready for anybody who has questions. <laughs> Rather looks as though you're going to get off lightly tonight. We do now have an actual question. Do you have any books that you would recommend people would read on this subject? Right. I have actually got another slide of the sources that um, have been used for this. Um, so the general report on Tunney was written in 1945 uh, uh, by these people. It was declassified in 2000. There's also the a fish report and from which I just quoted, written by um, Albert Small. Uh, and these two documents are available. Uh, they are original sources, but there are two books, uh, one by Jack Copeland, Professor Jack Copeland, uh, which is called Colossus, and uh, one by a chap called Paul Gannon. So uh, if I, I can hold these up so that people can see them. Well, that is Professor Copeland's book, and it's called Colossus, The Secret of Bletchley Park's Code-Breaking Computers. And this is the other one, and that is called Colossus, Bletchley Park's Greatest Secret um, by Paul Gannon. Now, this one by uh, Copeland is a, a collection of, of essays by various of the people who are actually involved. Uh, Good and Mickey, I'm not sure if Tim's actually wrote a chapter, but um, uh, Bill Tutt did and um, uh, Tommy Flowers. And so the, these are all brought together by Jack Copeland. And, he fills in the gaps. Uh, so you do get things from the horse's mouth, but it is all, there's quite a lot of technicality in it. Um, and for those who prefer, if you like, a more journalistic style, I would recommend Paul Gannell's uh, book on Colossus. We have another question. How important was Tommy Flowers' contribution? Oh, I think it was absolutely essential. Tommy Flowers was an absolutely remarkable guy. Uh, he came from a very humble background in, in, in Poplar in the East End of London. His father was a bricklayer. He left school at 16 and, and then worked at um, night school, eventually got himself a degree, joined the post office as a, a linesman and worked his way up and became head of the switching section of the post office research establishment. And he took Max Newman's ideas because Max Newman wasn't an engineer. He was a he was actually a topologist, uh, which is an area of mathematics that uh, um, I certainly have a great deal of difficulty with. Um, I remember chatting to a topologist in a bar once, and he said that he liked most working in five dimensions. So not exactly a very practical man necessarily, um, but he produced a, spe uh, a, a, a specification of what the problem was and how he thought it could be solved. And that was then turned into practical engineering by Tommy Flowers. So his role was absolutely crucial. Sadly, he didn't get that recognition he deserved for that until very, very late, late in his life when he got an honorary doctorate from Newcastle. Right. Um, there's a slightly vague question here that says, is it true that he made the machine in his own time? I'm not sure to whom he is being referred to here. I, I assume that's, that's uh, Tommy Flowers. Um, 
it's certainly true that he put his hand in his pocket and purchased some bits that were needed that he couldn't get uh, readily from post office stores. Uh, the details of that I don't know, but that is, a, I, I believe, a well attested part of the story. In his own time, well, this is wartime, and people were working all the hours that were available. And I mean, this, this, this whole machine was dis uh, designed and built uh, in such a short period between February and December 1943. It, it, it's truly amazing. I mean, there is a story that a uh, heat on my flowers um, drew out uh, uh, on a, a big sheet of paper all the component parts that he wanted and actually got his team together, tore off one of the components and said to one member of the team, go away and build that. And then another part component uh, and so on. And it was very much a, a team work uh, and, and then it was all brought together. And a lot of the people didn't know other than the specification he'd given them uh, as part of the machine. He didn't know what the whole the machine was about. No, he, he really was absolutely crucial to them. And um, yes, they, they all worked. Well, it was said that um, they, they worked um, six and a half, uh, five and a half days a week. They had half a day a week off for important matters, including Sunday, for important matters like getting their hair cut and speaking to their wives. <laughs> that was a quotation from Tommy Flowers in, in or one of the team in the 1980s. Okay. Um, would, hmm, will this talk be useful for A-level students looking to study computer science at university? And if so, what topics are you going to talk about? I don't know much. I don't know anything really about the uh, the current overall uh, syllabuses. Mm. Um, I would hope that a rounded education in computer science would include a little bit of history, but I don't think there is a lot that is likely to be asked in um, in their level papers now. Uh, but there is a very comprehensive uh, education facility at, provided by the National Museum of Computing. And if I'm talking to a A-level student or a, a, a teacher, uh, I would say get in touch with our education people. Um, Storm Ray is the person uh, who's in charge there. And uh, see if you can arrange a visit. And uh, it it's it could be very worthwhile to give people a, a perspective, and they have some uh, practical uh, tasks to be done, which will stimulate students. How plentiful is the supply of valves or vacuum tubes to keep colossus <laughs> working? Um, at the moment. At the moment, the supply of valves is quite good in that we um, have a store containing about 10 years worth. Um, but beyond that, I'm not an electronic engineer uh, or any sort of engineer. And uh, I've asked that question myself and haven't got a very straight re reply. I think there are the type of valve has been made more recently in Russia or and or Czechoslovakia. Um, but whether that is sufficiently good quality to be used, I don't know. At the moment, <coughs> there are about 10 valves fail each year. Um, you may know the story that uh, Tommy Flowers 
when he first put forward the idea of a machine with multiple valves in it, uh, there was a great deal of skepticism because people regarded valves as being extremely unreliable because of their experience with their um, domestic radios, which have three or four valves in them. Turn, turn it on and pop, one of the valves is gone. But Tommy Flowers knew from his pre-war experience that you, um, if you turn a valve on and never turn it off, you're not subjected to the thermal stresses that lead it to uh, be unreliable. And that's what they did with the, with the um, Colossus machine. They turned them on and kept them on all the time, despite the amount, large amount of um, electricity they were using. Well, the um, National Museum of Computing can't afford electricity to that extent. So there's a little bit of a cheat, which is a device called a Variac, which brings the voltage of the heaters in the valves up gradually over a minute or more uh, so that it treats them very gently instead of shocking them with um, turn on to full voltage. Uh, okay, um, is there any likelihood that the National Archives or GCHQ will declassify the document on the testeries linguistic methods? Any likelihood? Oh, if only. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, the, as you probably know, the secrecy is something that they carry to extremes in, in this country, it would seem. Um, I mean, this was all kept so secret for so long. It was only 2000, as I said, that the, uh, uh, the, the general uh, report on Tunney uh, was declassified. So the um, solution of German teleprinter ciphers, brackets, test read, linguistic methods, as it's indexed in the National Archives, it's clearly there, but as it's classified, they can't get at it. Unless you are, presumably, you work for GCHQ. So if you have any influence with, with GCHQ, <laughs> please suggest to them that it would be appropriate to declassify that. I mean, Alan Turing wrote two uh, papers about statistical aspects of uh, cryptanalysis uh, during the war, and they were declassified less than 10 years ago. And I think this will be our last question tonight. Um, from Wayne, I'm assuming blowfish from the 1942-1944 era lends its name to blowfish today's encryption technology. Is it safe to assume that? I suspect we have no idea. But, uh... I, I, you're absolutely right, I'm afraid I have no idea. I yes. don't know anything about today's blowfish. I, I doubt it, frankly. <clears throat> So I'm going to prepare to close the, this call. I'm just going to show a few lectures which are coming up now um, in November and early December. <clears throat> in just a couple of weeks time, we have uh, a lecture entitled The Great British Baker that ignited a business computer revolution. And those of you we don't know who the great British baker was. It was, of course, the Lions Tea Shops who created a computer system called Leo in various forms. The Lions Electronic Office. And that's on Tuesday, November 23rd. We have two virtual guided tours. Uh, one on November 28th and one on December 1st, which are docent led guided tours, but they're executed over Zoom. And last but not least, we have some experts reunited for the 40th anniversary of the BBC Micro. But with that, I think the time has come to close the call. I'd like to thank Ted for his time and enthusiasm and interest. And uh, thank you for anybody who'd like to say thank you <laughs> or give some applause.
And with that, I will close the call. Thank you very much.